This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Hey friends, Ben has never known a world without broadband, cell phones, MP3s, TiVo, and online shopping. The main effect of all this connectivity is unlimited and unfiltered access to culture and content of all sorts, from the mainstream to the farthest fringe of the underground. Ben is growing up in a different world from the one I grew up in, a world far less dominated by any of the traditional media and entertainment industries. If you don't recognize yourself in the sections to come in this audiobook, imagine Ben instead. His reality is the leading edge of all of our futures. From Ben's perspective, the cultural landscape is a seamless continuum from high to low, with commercial and amateur content competing equally for his attention. He simply doesn't distinguish between mainstream hits and underground niches. He picks what he likes from an infinite menu where Hollywood movies and player-created video game stunt videos are listed side by side. Ben watches just two hours or so a week of regular TV, mostly West Wing, time-shifted of course, and Firefly, a cancelled space serial that he has stored on his TiVo. He also counts as TV the anime he downloads with BitTorrent, a peer-to-peer file-sharing technology, because it was originally broadcast on Japanese television. The English subtitles are often edited in by fans. When it comes to movies, he's a sci-fi fan, so he's pretty mainstream. Star Wars is a passion, as was the Matrix series. But he also watches movies he downloads, such as Amateur Machinima, and movies made by controlling characters in video games, and independent productions such as Star Wars Revelations, a fan-created tribute film with special effects that rival the Lucas originals. Some of the music on his iPod is downloaded from iTunes, but most comes from his friends. When one of the group buys a CD, he or she typically makes copies for everyone else. Ben's taste is mostly classic rock, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, with a smattering of video game soundtracks. The only radio he listens to is when his parents turn on NPR in the car. Ben's reading ranges from Star Wars novels to Japanese manga, with a large helping of webcomics. He, like a few of his friends, is so into Japanese subculture that he's studying Japanese in school. When I was in school, kids studied Japanese because Japan was a dominant economic power and language skills were thought to open up career opportunities. But now kids study Japanese so they can create their own anime subtitles and dig deeper into manga than the relatively mainstream translated stuff. Most of Ben's free time is spent online, both randomly surfing and participating in user forums such as Halo and Star Wars discussion sites. He's not interested in news. He reads no newspapers and watches no TV news but follows the latest tech and subculture chatter on sites such as Slashdot, which is geek news, and FARC, weird news. He instant messages constantly all day with his ten closest friends. He doesn't text much on his cell phone, but he has friends that do. Texting is preferred by those who are out and about a lot. IM is the chat channel of choice for those who tend to spend more time in their own rooms. He plays video games with his friends, mostly online. He thinks Halo 2 rocks, especially user-modified levels. I suspect that had I been born 25 years later, my teenage years would have been quite similar. The main difference between Ben's adolescence and my own is simply choice. I was limited to what was broadcast over the airwaves. He's got the Internet. I didn't have TiVo or even cable. He has all that and BitTorrent, too. I had no idea there was such a thing as manga, much less how to get it. Ben has access to it all. Would I have watched Gilligan's Island reruns if I'd been able to build a clan with friends in World of Warcraft online instead? I doubt it. TV shows were more popular in the 70s than they are now, not because they were better, but because we had fewer alternatives to compete for our screen attention. What we thought was the rising tide of common culture actually turned out to be less about the triumph of Hollywood talent and more to do with the shepherding effect of broadcast distribution. The great thing about broadcast is that it can bring one show to millions of people with unmatched efficiency. But it can't do the opposite, bring a million shows to one person each. Yet that is exactly what the Internet does so well. The economics of the broadcast era required hit shows, big buckets, to catch huge audiences. The economics of the broadband era are reversed. Serving the same stream to millions of people at the same time is hugely expensive and wasteful for a distribution network optimized for point-to-point communications. There's still demand for big cultural buckets, but they're no longer the only market. The hits now compete with an infinite number of niche markets of any size, and consumers are increasingly favoring the ones with the most choice. The era of one-size-fits-all is ending, and in its place is something new, a market of multitudes. This audiobook is about that market.
This shattering of the mainstream into a zillion different cultural shards is something that upsets traditional media and entertainment no end. After decades of executives refining their skill in creating, picking, and promoting hits, those hits are suddenly not enough. The audience is shifting to something else, a muddy and indistinct proliferation of, well, we don't have a good term for such non-hits. They're certainly not misses, because most weren't aimed at world domination in the first place. They're everything else. It's odd that this should be an overlooked category. We are, after all, talking about the vast majority of everything. Most movies aren't hits, most music recordings don't make the top 100, most books aren't bestsellers, and most video programs don't even get measured by Nielsen, much less clean up in primetime. Many of them nevertheless record audiences in the millions worldwide. They just don't count as hits, and are therefore not counted. But they're where the formerly compliant mass market is scattering to. The simple picture of the few hits that mattered and the everything else that didn't is now becoming a confusing mosaic of a million mini-markets and microstars. Increasingly, the mass market is turning into a mass of niches. That mass of niches has always existed, but as the cost of reaching it falls, consumers finding niche products and niche products finding consumers is suddenly becoming a cultural and economic force to be reckoned with. The new niche market is not replacing the traditional market of hits, just sharing the stage with it for the first time. For a century, we have winnowed out all but the best sellers to make the most efficient use of costly shelf space, screens, channels, and attention. Now, in a new era of network consumers and digital everything, the economics of such distribution are changing radically as the Internet absorbs each industry it touches, becoming store, theater, and broadcaster at a fraction of the traditional cost. Think of these falling distribution costs as a dropping water line or a receding tide. As they fall, they reveal a new land that has been there all along, just underwater. These niches are a great uncharted expanse of products that were previously uneconomic to offer. Many of these kinds of products have always been there, just not visible or easy to find. They are the movies that didn't make it to your local theater, the music not played on the local rock radio station, the sports equipment not sold at Walmart. Now they're available via Netflix, iTunes, Amazon, or just some random place Google turned up. The invisible market has turned visible. Other niche products are new, created by an emerging industry at the intersection between the commercial and non-commercial worlds, where it's hard to tell when the professionals leave off and the amateurs take over. This is the world of bloggers, video makers, and garage bands, all suddenly able to find an audience thanks to those same enviable economics of digital distribution. The 98% Rule This book began with a quiz I got wrong. One of the things I do as the editor of Wired is give speeches about technology trends. Because I started my career in the science world and then learned economics at The Economist, I look for those trends first in hard data. And, fortunately enough, there has never been more data available. The secrets of 21st century economics lie in the servers of the companies that are all around us, from eBay to Walmart. Although it's not always easy to get the raw numbers, the executives at those companies swim in that data every day and have a great intuitive feel for what's meaningful and what isn't. So the trick to trend spotting is to ask them which is what I was doing in January 2004 in the offices of Robbie Van Adibe, the CEO of Ecast, a digital jukebox company. Digital jukeboxes are just like regular jukeboxes, a big enclosure with speakers and blinking lights, often found in bars, with the difference that rather than a hundred CDs, they have a broadband connection to the Internet, and patrons can choose from thousands of tracks that are downloaded and stored on a local hard drive. During the course of our conversation, Van Adibe asked me to guess what percentage of the 10,000 albums available on the jukeboxes sold at least one track per quarter. I knew, of course, that Van Adibe was asking me a trick question. The normal answer would be 20% because of the 80-20 rule, which experience tells us applies practically everywhere. That is, 20% of products account for 80% of sales, and usually 100% of the profits. But Van Adibe was in the digital content business, which is different. So I thought I'd go way out on a limb and venture that a whopping 50% of those 10,000 albums sold at least one track a quarter. 
Now, on the face of it, that's absurdly high. Half of the top...